Thank you. I'm being put through how to operate what is before me. The Vice President and Guest of Honor on this occasion of the 63rd anniversary of our nation's independence. The head of the Civil Service of the Federation, the Chief of Staff to the President, Ministers of the Federal Republic, heads of executive bodies and extra ministerial departments, members of the diplomatic community, permanent secretaries, service chiefs, directors general and other heads of federal government agencies, processors and corporations, heads of paramilitary services, directors of the civil service and other directors service-wide, gentlemen of the press and members of the first estate of the realm, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I am honored to be invited as the lead speaker at today's event of public lecture cum symposium marking the 63rd anniversary of our nation's independence. I'm grateful to the SGF as chairman and all the members of the Interministerial Inter Committee of the 63rd Independence Anniversary for, advice, for identifying me to discharge this function. It is my hope that my presentation will do justice to the confidence that they have reposed in me. Actualizing the vision of renewed hope for social economic development of Nigeria through effective leadership is a topic that I have been assigned. It is not a light topic or one meant for or born out of banters. Renewed hope is the theme of the manifesto under which our president and his deputy ran their campaign. My understanding, therefore, is that renewed hope is born out of a consciousness of missed opportunities in a country widely recognized for its immense and limitless potentials and the determination of a man of vision to galvanize the entire populace to believe in the immense possibilities that this nation offers while offering himself to lead the way. I do not need to get us bored by reeling out the sad tales of our statistics on national development from independence in 1960 to date. It might just suffice to remember where we were in 1960 in relation to China, India, Pakistan, Malaysia, Singapore, the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, Brazil, etc., and where those countries are today. Or by just comparing us with ourselves to remember where we were in 1980 in terms of our manufacturing industries, oil production, security of lives and property, and individual honor as human beings compared to where we are today. We run poorly, not just on human development index, but on all global indices of, nation, of a nation's performance, namely government effectiveness, corruption control index, poverty index, social cohesion, and peace index. Our global ranking on government effectiveness index, which measures perception of the quality of our public services, the civil service, the quality of policy formulation and implementation, and the credibility of government's MDA's commitment to such policies has been hovering between 162nd and 169th in the last seven years, compared to our neighbor that runs second on the GDP in Africa, South Africa, that is at 62. The only measurement where we have been on a steady and unmitigated rise is our population, which has serious implications for our national planning, more so that the median age of our population at 18.6 is one of the lowest in the world, and contrasts sharply with the figures for South Africa at 28 
Mauritius at 36.3, United Kingdom at 40.6, Cuba at 42.1, Germany at 47.8, and Japan at 48.6. These sad statistics are certainly what must have been troubling Ebola Ahmed Tinumbu as to envision what he will want his dear country to be under the Renew Hope agenda of his manifesto. The eight point agenda are food security, poverty eradication, economic growth, job creation, access to capital inclusion, rule of law, and fighting corruption. Through this eight point agenda, the Bola Ahmed Tinubu administration is, according to one of his key one of the key members of his team, Mr. Wali Edu, seeking to, I quote, move away from the frenzied borrowing of the last government to check the unacceptable high jobless rate, achieve economic growth, prosperity for all, and end poverty. And he gave marching order to his ministers to deliver the first phase of the agenda within three years. Indeed, as we have now all now witnessed, the president could not wait to begin to lay the building blocks for the realization of this avowed vision. As you will recall, right from the grounds of his swearing in ceremony, he started to plug the leakages in the economy with his pronouncement on the removal of the opaque subsidy to premium motor spirit, PMS. Then there were sector-specific appointments of replacement in CEO positions and or of special advisors and investigators to unravel what is going on in the Revenue Generation and Economic Crime Agency, the CBN, EFCC, and so on and so forth. His assemblage of ministers has answered many floating questions of inclusiveness, be it on gender, youth, national unity, and or political stability and technical know-how. His cabinet setup has recognized the enormous potentials of certain sectors for the economy as to propel him to free those sectors of any institutional encumbrances to enable them to unleash the opportunities that are bound in those sectors for global competitiveness. In this case, we remember culture and creative industry, the blue economy. His deployment of ministerial portfolios is challenging hitherto biases and stereotypes on religious and or ethnic appropriation of certain posts. And through his actions, is restoring a sense of belonging to every Nigerian, irrespective of their religious or ethnic background. His foreign trips so far have been driven mainly by the need to attract investments for our country. And the trips to India and the United Arab Emirates are classic examples. Even his attenders of the United Nations General Assembly still witness positive news on investment in the oil sector. These investments are coming in magnitudes that have, that have appeared elusive in the last 10 years. At all times during those trips, he ensures that he meets the Nigerian community in the diaspora to avail them of his programs at home. And the feedback that people like me have been receiving is encouraging. Where mistakes have been made, he has responded promptly with more acceptable options. It is obvious that every aspect of this setup has been deliberately considered and put forward by the president, as none appears to be a fortuitous coincidence. I have been around the top level of the bureaucracy since the commencement of the Fourth Republic in 1999. But this is the first time that I am seeing all these factors play out in just one man. Nigeria is at a dawn, a new dawn, and I would like to employ one of our main national symbols to illustrate my take. Our coat of arms, the Nigerian coat of arms, is composed of a black shield denoting our fertile soil that is transversed from both the northwest and northeast by two great rivers, Niger and Benue, respectively, which meet almost at the center of that vast land 
to continue their journey southwards to discharge their content in a maze of delta-induced distributaries to the Atlantic Ocean. There are two horses holding aloft that shield, and they represent dignity, while the eagle represents strength. Unfortunately, it appears that the eagle has lost its feathers, not by molting, the natural process of feather shedding that is bound to induce regrowth, but by bacteria and virus-induced losses, symptomatic of our years of mismanagement, corruption, and leadership deficiency at all sectors of our national economy and human endeavors across all tiers of government at national and subnational levels. And so, the great eagle continues to perch on the toss. But right now, however, a new spirit is awakening the eagle, the spirit of a visionary. In line with Section 147 of the Constitution, which vest in the President the powers to establish office of ministers as he may wish, he has appointed his ministers and assigned portfolios to them. These ministers, as his principal representatives, are already working with the permanent secretaries and CEOs of parasitas and agencies and corporations on ground in their respective ministries as accounting officers. Together, they, I mean all of you seated here, and others like you that are outside, are to provide the required leadership in your respective offices. It is with them that the powers for the Nigeria Eagle to fly now lies. As leaders sitting here and outside listening to us, how far we can go in mustering the muscles of effectiveness on our various desk, and by so doing regrow the feathers of the eagle to make it fly, we depend on one, our ability as political office holders and career bureaucrats to key into the vision of the president and to work in synergy as to as core reinforcing components to drive that agenda. And our ability to appreciate the depth of certain factors that have posed challenges to our public services over the years and our determination and commitment to overcome those challenges. Actualizing the vision of renewed hope for social economic development of Nigeria through effective leadership is contingent upon appreciation of certain issues, namely government structure. Two, effective coordination and clear-cut responsibilities between the SGF, the COSP, and the head of service. Three, imperative of consultation, cooperation, and collaboration. Four, responsiveness, proactive initiative. Five, managing the capacity challenge of the service. Six, pay and labor issues. Seven, minister permanent secretary relationship. Eight, fighting corruption and nine, citizen responsibility. The structure of ground, our first task is to appraise the structure that is currently unfolding from the appointment of the largest number of ministers in our history and the portfolios that have been assigned to them. On this, there are two observations that I'd like to make. One, the number at 48 going 50. Two, the creation and carving out of new ministries. Three, the return of the concept of coordinating minister. The sheer number per se should not pose a problem if the checks and balances cross-cutting measures in extant circulars and the, and the public service rules and financial regulations are enforced. The salary of ministers is not where the headache of government lies, as the remuneration of ministers is just slightly above those of commissioners in executive bodies like the Federal Character Commission. The real problem is with the unrecognized and under the table parkocytes of limitless dimensions that we seek and the manipulation of projects to satisfy personal interests and the interests of political parties towards. The role of the SGF in bringing these checks and balances cross-cutting measures to the attention of all political office holders through service-wide circulars 
and ensuring their enforcement is crucial. As a first step, he himself will have to set the example in his official dealings. Creation and or carving out of new ministries is positive for the economy, as it will unlock the potentials hitherto hidden because of fund migration from their vote heads to satisfy requirements in other areas of ministry that are putting pressure. A classic case is the phase of culture and tourism subsectors under the now defunct Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. I served in that ministry, so I know. Even, when a, even with a permanent secretary that made her career in culture, the information consumed most of their funds. The creation, having an alignment of ministries in any administration are bound to elicit some form of struggle for mandate capture or, ret or retention. The main challenge, however, is how to quickly, is how quickly the required alignment of ministerial structure and the consequential movement of personnel is made to take place. In this regard, it is expected that the personnel expertise that exists under the establishment matters, management services and organizational design units within the office of the head of the civil service of the federation, as well as the guidance of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms have been activated to carry out the expected alignment as objectively as possible and without compromising institutional integrity. The idea of some people moving by themselves or lobbying to migrate to perceived new juicy ministry must, be con must not be condoned by the head of the civil service. Return of the concept of coordinating minister. In my book, Restoring Good Governance in Nigeria, Volume 1, pages 222 to 225, I have extracted the concept of the coordinating minister of the economy title bestowed on Dr. Ngozi Iweala, stating that government structures are not created to sway to the ego or conform to the personality structure of an appointee, but on the promise of the long-term vision that whoever occupies the post will be empowered to perform the functions attached to the office, and further stressing that political appointees should fit into government structures and official titles in a manner that tenants are made to fit into rented apartments, as that is what political appointees are, tenants in official positions. Now we have two ministers, so designated in this administration. I believe that there must be an ongoing thought between each of the two ministers that currently carry the, tit the title, that currently carry the coordination prefix to their respective titles, with the office of the head of the civil service, as well as the office of the secretary to the government of the federation, as to the aligned ministries of coordination, and that the bureaucratic support to service the coordination is being, is being assembled, and that is being assembled. Personally, I would like to see the concept extended a little further by having coordinating minister for infrastructure and to expand the scope of the coordination under the Minister of Health to cover human development so that education can come into the fold as it is in Indonesia. In our setting, and bearing in mind the focus of the eight-point agenda, an interministerial approach to bring line ministries to relate with one another, to articulate common grounds for program initiation and execution will be a positive thing, provided that we will ensure geopolitical balance in assigning the coordination. Excuse me, please. Effective coordination and clear cut responsibilities between the SGF, the Chief of Staff, and the Head of the Civil Service. Actualizing the vision of Renew Hope for Social Economic Development of Nigeria through effective leadership is contingent upon effective coordination and clear-cut roles and responsibilities among the leadership of the central bureaucratic offices of government, namely the SGF, the head of service, and the chief of staff to the president. There is the need to appreciate the constitutional limitations and structural gaps that do not foster effective coordination of the public service by either the SGF or the head of the civil service. The centrality of the 
sec of, of the Office of the Secretary of Government to the effective coordination and performance of the presidential bureaucracy holds the key to the success of the administration. While the Secretary of the Government of the Federation is not constitutionally empowered to control any service at any, uh, at any given time, it is still supported with at least six permanent secretaries, many of whom are charged with responsibilities that have cross-cutting impact, such as economic affairs, political affairs, special services on security, ecological funds office, apart from cabinet office, and the general services office. In addition, the establishment of the Office of Policy and Coordination in the office, though at a political office holder level at the moment, provides the crucial platform to track the implementation of the Renewed Hope Agenda, as that office can work in collaboration with the economic and political offices and through them to the entire public service. By the same token, notwithstanding the constitutional interpretation of the civil service of the Federation as service of the Federation in a civil capacity, the scope of the responsibility of the head of the civil service of the Federation is confined to the mainstream civil service comprising of officers carrying the employment letters issued by the Federal Civil Service Commission, and they constitute less than 6% of the federal workforce. Therein lies the structural gaps induced challenge of coordination of the federal public service, where a sitting head of the civil service of the Federation is looked up for guidance and resolution of issues across the entire service, and yet is not able to exercise control over those other services. The Chief of Staff to the President is the inner ring of the presidential bureaucracy. The office is designed to manage the time and space of the President. Synergy in the official relationships of the three offices is sine qua non to the actualization of the Renew Hope Agenda. The creation, carving out, and or realignment of ministries in this administration are bound to elicit some form of struggle for mandate capture or retention. It is imperative that ministers involved, working with their permanent secretaries, are able to resolve this as quickly as possible so that they can settle down to work. No matter how the mandates are spelled out, there will always be some form of overlap. Duplication is what we should strive to avoid, but overlap in functions are an inescapable outcome of an organizational operations. As I, as I once said in my address to the 40th National Council on Health in 1995, ministries, extra-ministerial departments and agencies are enjoined to close ranks and plug the loopholes in their laws to enable them to translate their seeming overlapping functions to strong bonds of strength and effectiveness, as each organ of government is like a building block in in the national structure, and no building can stand if the component blocks do not have some overlap. Responsiveness and proactive initiative. How promptly do CEOs of government agencies respond to issues within their mandates brought to their attention? The general complaint is that correspondences are either attended to very late or not responded to at all. Telephone calls are often not returned under the pretense of they are being too busy or attending to meet meetings. We must constantly be reminded of the key requirement that government offices and agencies must be alert to their responsibilities and responsive to the yearnings of the citizens. In the face of the many local challenges that have begun to coalesce and snowball to national problems, this requirement has now become an urgent imperative. Public servants are servants of the public, not their bosses. We need to turn the table of low public confidence in the capacity of our public services across all arms of government at national and sub-national levels, as reflected in the quality of policy formulation and implementation, as well as the enforcement of laws and regulations, the degree of their independence from political pressures, and the credibility of the commitment of government itself to such policies. The capacity for proactive initiatives is a defining key attribute of professionalism and leadership. 
It is an innate quality that sits at the nexus of inspiration and reflex. When it is lacking in people holding executive positions, the safety valve lies in their dual capacity for receptiveness to creative problems of ideas by others and the courage to leverage those ideas to take prompt actions. Premium importance need to be placed on capacity for proactive initiatives, receptivity to ideas, and the courage to take prompt actions in making appointment into top executive positions in government offices and agencies. Job creation as one of the key pillars of the Renewal Hope agenda demands a critical review of our current approach to recruitment, the youth challenge, and the crisis of succession in public service. The Council of Retired Federal Permanent Secretaries is advocating, and I quote, a scientific and predictable system of relieving the system of non-performing officers across the strata of the civil service. It's approaching that that should be put in place to enhance its slimness and efficiency order an overarching pro-youth recruitment strategy of the Nigerian public service rejuvenation and reinvigoration. Towards this end, the Council is calling our government to, I quote, embark on structural recruitment processes to ensure that the best talents are hired into the public service and to back it up with an attractive and competitive compensation system to retain them in the service. The current trend of clamor for increase of retirement age from 60 to 65 years should be discouraged as it runs counter to pro-youth policy and strategies. Instead, policies that promote renewal and career progression of talents, such as the tenor policy, is what should be implemented in all their ramifications. The median age of Nigeria, as I said earlier, at 18.6, and the retirement age of the public service at 60, give the age band of 41.4 years, compared to less than 30 years for most countries. Still talking about the, the COFEPS recommendation, I'd like to also expose here that COFEPS is also as, uh, uh, advocating the immediate implementation of Regulation 1 to make, the federal, to make the Foreign Service a separate service. Pay, the issues of pay and labor relations, though not directly obvious, constitute underbelly challenges to effective execution of any vision, especially as labor union agitation is currently dominating the airwaves. Despite the multiplicity of heterogeneous salaries and scales, whether it is HAPS, CONJUS, CONTIS, COMMERCE, TSS, ETC, there is still an endless agitation by every professional organization for a separate scale for their sector and members. The issue of dichotomy between treasury-funded and self-funded special salary structure and the skewed perception of greater importance attached to revenue-generating or revenue collection agencies over their policy department counterparts are potentials for institutionalized corruption. The importance of civil servants in policy desk should never be underestimated in remuneration packages. The undue burden on government in payment sentiments arising from cases of questionable procurement leading to default, as you found, at his, you found in the combined expatriate resident permit and alien card contract, and of the process and industrial development limited, where Nigeria is currently facing a UK arbitration settlement of over $11 billion, and several others like them, should be a lesson to government. The capacity of a nation to grow its economy, its economy base is contingent on its ability to move state resources in the direction of capital expenditure for the provision of infrastructure, social services, security, etc. It is this that in turn will affect what can be available for salaries. It is imperative that government develops a national pay policy.
on labor issues, I'd like to draw attention to certain basic facts. One, labor unions seem to ignore the basic fact that the business of government is to deliver development and services to the populace, and that workers' salary should appropriately be contingent on, one, how well this sacred duty of government is achieved, and two, ability to pay. Government is not set up merely to pay salaries. Two, their focus on the present without consideration for future workforce is against the principle of sustainable development as, as, as enshrined in the uh, constitutional provision of equal access to gainful employment, which also implies intergenerational equity. Three, the percentage of workers under the umbrella of the unionized labor is small compared to other Nigerians struggling to make ends meet in their micro and nano businesses. Four, there is low productivity of many workers in government, the absence of whom do not dent the performance of government agencies as proven by the COVID-19 protocols. Five, labor issues are often used to exert pressures of political relevance rather than shape the public sector for the better. Hence, the agitations are strategically timed at points of political weakness of a ruling party, usually before the admission setting or just before elections. Six, labor unions place undue focus on remuneration, leaving out human resources issues. For example, their struggle in the last two years have been on minimum wage, whereas the majority of public servants across MDAs have been agonizing their stagnation predicament arising from the suspension of the tenor policy and the absence of consequential vacancies for their promotion. Minister, Permanent Secretary Relationship, the imperative of mutual respect. Ministers as political heads must strive to accord respect to their accounting officers if they want to succeed. Of course, those accounting officers themselves must also conduct themselves in manners that will earn them that respect. As I stated in my book, page 275, in order to command the respect of their ministers, permanent secretaries should bring the experience of their years of service to bear on their job through proactive initiatives in the quality of their advice, the maturity of handling sensitive and volatile situations, the timeliness of their response to issues, particularly on the directives of their ministers, and their strong commitment to, upload, to uphold the ethics and values of the system. Reciprocally, ministers in particular will need to exercise great restraint so as not to be perceived as operating under the illusion of absolute knowledge and authority. Neither should they be seen as exploiting the advantage of their unfettered access to the president and the press to undermine and or ridicule their permanent secretaries and other accounting officers. That there are permanent secretaries and directors that are in their 35th year of their service should minister to the youthful ministers in the cabinet about the limits of their know-all postures. To restore the integrity of permanent secretaries' call, in assigning permanent secretary to ministry, the musical chair mentality of deployment must give way to a fit-for-purpose ministry assignment. And permanent secretaries found wanting after two rounds of deployment on account of irreconcilable differences with their ministers and in the absence of, in the absence of sound defense by the head of the civil service should be re retired in the public interest. Merit should determine appointments and promotion, not patronage. There should be no room to entertain questions about capacity, professional competence, or corruption of accounting officers in MDAs, as the president is at liberty to determine who is his appointee as a PAMSEC or DG, executive secretary, etc. Fighting corruption. Corruption has festered more despite our multiple anti-corruption laws 
and their enforcement institutions. Across all sectors, whether it is the NAPC, the CBN, FRS, Customs, and the, nat the nation's woes have continued to mount. With the integrated payroll and personal information, personal information system, the Treasury single account in place, humongous amounts of leakages have continued to occur in the Treasury of government. This speak of the integrity of many in leadership positions. The searchlight for public sector corruption is always on the career public or civil servants, rather than on the political office holders. This is because, as I stated in my book on page 37 and 38, in the kitchen of public sector corruption, the civil servant is the cook that carefully selects all the ingredients and bakes them into an appetizing cake. The, he is also the waiter that takes the ready product to the laps of the political office holder, and also the cleaner that ensures that any fallout is carefully tidied up so that whoever comes into the system later will not see a sign that anyone has eaten anything therefrom. There are, there are at least 18 channels that I have identified through which recurrent appropriations are abused regularly by accounting officers in collusion with their political heads. Indeed, the art of budget manipulation for personal gains as a mode of operation of yearly appropriations of MDAs has become a coveted expertise that certain political office holders had hunt in the deployment of permanent secretaries and the appointment of DGs as accounting officers in their MDAs. It is incumbent on the accounting officers to checkmate their political heads and themselves from bloated and unrealistic paraphernalia of office in terms of an endless list of parasites spanning support staff, fleet of vehicles, working tools, energy source, and office space layout, hiding under the cover of purchase of project vehicles betrayed the public trust. The success of the president in actualizing his renewed hope agenda is contingent on his commitment to really deal with corrupt officials in leadership positions, be they political appointees or career public servants. Doing that at the topmost level is critical, as the integrity backbone of the occupants of those positions is what the accounting officers and their subordinates will rely upon for the courage to do their own job. In conclusion, counting our blessings as a nation, citizen responsibility. Two years ago, on the occasion of Nigeria's 61st independence anniversary, at the Lux Teraf Leadership Foundation Town Hall meeting on solution-driven and forward-thinking approaches, I issued a statement titled, Nigeria at 61, where do we go from here? Saying that Nigeria has the best balance sheet of natural resources endowment to natural hazard and disaster in the world. And I liken our situation to the proverbial Akebaje spoiled brat in Yoruba folklore. I stated that Nigerians are like spoiled brats in the presence of God Almighty. As the Yoruba will say, Akebaje timba omoluwoje, meaning undue indulgence is what has rendered the child of the affluent useless. First, you find him crying, and when he's asked what is the matter, he says it's because I am hungry. So you instruct the steward to serve him a good plate of food. Barely a minute after the plate of food has been placed in front of him, he bursts out crying again. And patiently, you ask him what the, what the problem is this time. And he answers, the pile of meat in the plate is not allowing me to reach the soup below. <laughs> Consider the abundance of our minerals, our, our biodiversity, with as many as 1,000 species within one kilometer in some cases. Ask Minister Dele Alake and the Minister of Environment. And if I may borrow the communication swagger 
of Minister Yeson Wike of the FCT, where I served. Gold, we get them. Gypsum, we get them. Bentonet, we get them. Gemstone, go. Ide nyafu But earthquake, we no get them. Tsunami, we no get them. Hurricane, tornadoes, not be our portion. Even the flood that we get, our own Nigeria, Nigeria, compared to what other countries face, as we can see. Our malaria gas treatment is not like SARS of East Asia countries or Ebola of a neighboring country. Throw maize or yam to the soil in your backyard, you will harvest something in a few months. As citizens of this great country, we need to stop acting like spoiled brats. We must sit up and appreciate the enormous opportunities that God has placed before us by virtue of our natural resource endowment, his protection over us from natural disasters, and the beauty of our triple intertwining diversities across biological, physical terrain, and cultural spheres. These are wholesome blessings that present themselves to us as opportunities as a nation, opportunities that will elude us if we choose not to embrace them, but decide to cling to primordial sectional agenda. We owe it a duty to ourselves, to our children, and the generations yet of born to play our parts as leaders at whatever level we find ourselves. The election of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, despite all the odds on his path, must minister to us as a nation about the awesomeness and grace of God. As the president, he has praised before us his vision of renewed hope. At this time in our nation's history, he is the eagle on our nation's coat of arms. The visionary has perched, but his plumage is going to be provided by all of us in leadership positions at all levels across the three tiers of government in this nation at national and subnational levels. The issues that I've identified in this paper are the feathers to be regenerated by the effective leadership that he is expecting you all to provide in your respective positions. He is anxiously waiting for these feathers to enable him to spread those wings to their full span and lift up for Nigeria to soar to the skies, the skies of his social economic development, national unity and prosperity. Happy 63rd anniversary of our nation's independence. I thank you all.